do you want me to stop Did sharing you want, right uh, now right now you can we can stop the sharing online. but you want to see the slides uh, if they're working uh, weba, weba you can just go through it once good evening all welcome to I online pd parul am i audible may i request uh, so you are audible may i request the audience to please mute themselves uh, good evening all welcome to isa online pg classes and uh, greetings from isa national headquarters uh, today we have amongst us dr jawhari naik and who shall be sharing her experience on vascular access and anesthesiologist uh, we have got uh, dr parul jindal uh, who shall be coordinating today's session uh, over to you paru for further proceedings unmute yourself unmute yourself paru a very good afternoon uh, everyone safe vascular access as we all know is integral for anesthetist and critical care practice but procedures are a frequent source of patient as well adverse effects to ensure that we have safe and effective uh, vascular access is a must for all of us today we have to, among us dr vibha nayak who will be telling us about the vascular access and the anesthetics dr vibha nayak is working as a um, consultant senior consultant onco anesthesiologist and intensivist at indo american cancer hospital and research institute at hyderabad her area of interest is pediatric onco anesthesia and vascular access she has been a speaker at various national and international forums with 46 index publication and six book chapters to her credit she is an iapa pediatric anesthesia fellow and she has been a past treasurer for iapa she is an executive member of the asian society of pediatric anesthesiologists she runs ica and soapc accredited onco anesthesia fellowship programs and dnb palliative care medicine she is editor of isa hyderabad may now invite, invite dr vibha to take over thank you thank you so much dr parul and at the outset i wish to thank uh, navin malhotra sir for giving me this opportunity it is indeed my pleasure to be on this forum on the national forum with uh, so many post graduates who've logged in to talk on a topic that is so dear to my heart are my slides visible dr parul yes dr vibha full yes, screen visible yeah. yes yes full sure. screen sure right thank you um so this topic is very close to my heart as dr parul just mentioned i work in a cancer hospital and uh, we have had the opportunity to be involved in the vascular access techniques even the advanced vascular access techniques for our patients i bring greetings from basav tarkam indo american Basav Tarkam Indo American Cancer Hospital and Research Institute. This is a 500 bed standalone cancer hospital, and we do about 8,500 major cancer surgeries per year. Uh, as Dr. Parul just mentioned, we run the ICA and SOPC accredited onco anesthesia fellowships, and we also have DNB palliative medicine. Now, I'm going to start with a very interesting question. which of the following books has a chapter on vascular access a miller's textbook of anesthesia b clinical anesthesia by paul barash c anesthesia secrets by brian keech and none of the above <clears throat> i would want the residents to enter the choice i'm not very sure how many um are still reading millers but i'm sure anesthesia secrets and barash clinical anesthesia is something that uh, most anesthesiologists would read okay so i think i can see a three there so i assume that they are mentioning uh, about anesthesia secrets okay no more answers 
Okay, there's no, one yes. four. Yeah, there's one D. And that is probably the right answer. None of the above. I'm sure you all agree that vascular access is something we do day in and day out. But none of the standard anesthesia textbooks have a chapter that is dedicated to vascular access. And that was the reason I thought that this topic has to be included in this session. And I requested Dr. Naveen Malhotra, sir, to give me this session. It is a primary skill that the anesthesiologist should know. We are often labeled as the vein specialist. And if there's a difficult vein, possibly anywhere across the hospital, they would come searching for an anesthesiologist who can help secure an IV access. And hence, it is very important that we have the knowledge of not just the techniques, but also the advanced types of vascular access. And that is exactly what I'm going to cover over the next hour or so. Now, let me admit, vascular access is part science and part art. Science, yes, you need to know the indications, contraindications, the complications that can occur. And art, because of the way you perform the technique, the techniques are all described, but still, I'm sure you know an anesthesiologist who's very skillful in performing a particular technique. And that is the art component of it. I hope to put forth a lot of, I hope to put forth a lot of science and also keep giving nits and bits of the art that I feel is required for these accesses. Okay, yet another question for you. Plan for vascular access should begin at the time of A, during the pre-anesthetic evaluation, B, in the pre-operative holding area, C, before anesthesia induction, and D, none of the above. Okay, so I start seeing some answers here, A, A, Okay, A, one more A there. <clears throat> Perfect. I completely agree with all of you out there that the plan for vascular access should begin during your pre-anesthetic evaluation. That's because the vascular access can depend on a lot of factors. There are patient-related factors like this old lady with a lot of edema in her limbs or maybe that chubby child that you can see on the right. It can also depend on the type of surgery, whether it is superficial, a short duration surgery, or it is a major surgery like an onchoanesthesia or the type of medication that the patient would require. And I'll come to it a bit later including the duration of treatment. So I do not want you to think only about the intraoperative period, but you also should be aware of what treatment would be required for this patient in the post-operative period. For example, if you are going to give anesthesia for a craniotomy, you should know that mannitol, which is a hyper or smaller solution, would be required for this patient for about a week or so. And this should be taken into consideration while you're planning the vascular axis. And the most important point of today's class that I want to emphasize right in the beginning is that the plan for vascular axis is an essential component of anesthesia care plan. Now, just as all across the world, we talk about uh, global warming, we talk about preserving the resources that we have, similar is thought about for the vessels. There are a limited number of veins that are available. Of course, veins do regenerate, but the concept of vessel health and preservation has been introduced by uh, it is a very good textbook and is very well covered by Nancy Moru in this book. And it begins with assessment of the uh, venous axis, uh, selection based on the requirement, and then evidence-based 
insertion technique, management, and evaluation to be able to use the selected vascular axis in the most optimum way. Okay, one more question to make sure that you are still with me. Is there a score that can be used to assess the difficulty of venous axis? Have you heard of any of a score like say A, DIVA score? Or B is Malampati score, C, cage questionnaire, and D, SOFA score. Okay, so I get a couple of options here. I can see a couple of A's and a D. <clears throat> okay, so looks like um, not many. Okay, there's one more A and that is the right answer. So the A DIVA score, which is also called as the adult difficult vascular access score is what is used. And I'll come to it in my next slide. We all know that Malampati score is used for difficult airway, uh, difficult airway prediction. The cage questionnaire is used for uh, assessing the alcohol dependence and SOFA score is, to, is used to assess sepsis. Coming to the A DIVA score, in 2016, Van Loon et al. proposed this score uh, based on more than 1,000 adult surgical patients in which the incidence of failed peripheral IV cannulation was 17%. And there were five parameters that were found to be useful in assessing difficulty. Each parameter was assigned a score of one. The five parameters are difficult to visualize, difficult to palpate, history of previous difficult venous axis, if the surgery is an unplanned indication, and diameter of the vein less than two millimeters as assessed on ultrasound. And based on the score, the total score, the patients were categorized as zero to one, those with low risk, two to three with intermediate risk, and more than four was considered high risk. But this was perioperative, right? In the emergency room, a similar score was uh, put forth, which is called as the C-DIVA score, which is the comprehensive difficult IV access score. And four out of the five parameters from the previous score were taken. And each parameter was then based on the difficulty scored into zero, one, and two. And here, the low risk uh, is equal to score between 0 to 3 and 4 to 5 being medium and more than 6 is high. So anyone with medium risk of vascular axis, the axis first attempt should be done by a competent practitioner and with the use of gadgets, whatever are available. And anybody who is a high risk may be considered for a central venous axis or an intraosseous axis based on the situation of emergency. Now, let's move on to how do we decide whether a central or a peripheral venous axis is required based on the medication that is going to be used. So what factors decide the choice of central versus peripheral venous axis? A, pH and osmolarity of the solution. B, percentage of dextrose in the solution. C, irritant or vesicant nature of the drug and all of the above. Perfect. I see a lot of Ds out there, which is the right answer. And I'm going to it in my next slide. So based on the type of the medication, it is imperative that we select a central axis, if the pH of the solution is going to be less than 5 or more than 9, if the osmolarity is going to be more than 600, if the solution is hypo or hypertonic, and if the concentration of dextrose in the solution is more than 10%, which is typically in the parental nutrition solutions, and if the solution is either irritant or vesicant. Now, now, let me get you to the crux of this topic today, which is the classification of vascular access.
So vascular axis could be arterial, venous, or introscious. I'm not going to cover arterial today because I think I'm going to fall short of time. We are going to mainly talk about venous axis, the different types of venous axis, and a little bit on introscious axis. So venous axis, as I just mentioned, can be peripheral or central. In the peripheral venous axis, it is either a peripheral cannula that we see most of the times, or it can be a midline catheter. Now, some of you are hearing the midline catheter possibly for the first time, but I'm going to cover it in the talk today. And in the central venous axis, I'm going to cover the peripherally inserted central catheters, which is also called as the pick line, or the regular central line, which is a non-tunneled and non-cuffed central venous catheter, or a Hickman catheter or any other type of tunneled and cuffed catheter. And finally, the implanted port. So I'm sure as residents, some of you are, are hearing some of these names for the first time. And I'm sure you'll enjoy to know what it is, when is it used and how it is used. There is another way to classify venous axis, and that is based on the duration of axis. So I'm sure you all know that the peripheral line is a short duration venous axis. It cannot be preserved for more than three to five days. Midline catheter has a little longer dwell duration, up to one to two weeks, and a non-tunneled central line can stay up to two to three weeks. The intermediate duration venous axis is the peripherally inserted central catheter, which can last for weeks to months. And the classic long-term or the long duration venous axis are the Hickman catheters and the implanted ports, which can be kept for months or even years. Now, there is a little bit of discrepancy between various groups on the recommended device duration. So the EPIC-3 guidance, which was uh, put up in 2014 by the UK group, and it, these are actually the NHS guidelines, are probably little more liberal on the peripheral intravenous catheter and the midline catheters, the durations are a little longer as compared to the other group, which is the MAGIC study group. MAGIC here stands for Michigan Appropriateness Guide for Intravenous Catheters. So this is the US-based group who seem to be more liberal with the usage of the peripherally inserted central catheters and they prefer putting long-term vascular axis uh, for uh, relatively smaller durations like a pick line for anybody who requires a venous axis for more than six days and a tunneled central line, anybody who requires it for more than two weeks. Now, starting with each individual axis. And the first one aptly is the peripheral venous axis. This is an axis that we do day in and day out. And I'm sure all of you would agree that knowledge of the anatomy of the veins and the various venous plexuses is extremely important for you to anticipate where the vein could be because not all veins would be visible or palpable. Sometimes you just have to uh, anticipate uh, where the vein could be. Some small tips. If you are putting an IV cannulation in a child and if the child is over fasted, there is a likelihood that all the veins would be collapsed. So that is another reason for you to avoid over fasting and stick to allowing oral clear liquids up to two hours prior to surgery in younger children. Also, those of you who like to gas down your children by putting sevoflurane at a very high dial concentration, remember that it causes vasodilatation and your venous axis a good looking vein can suddenly collapse after you've got the child inside. The way you perform the line is extremely important. The, the height at which 
the patient is, the table is, whether you're standing or sitting, it is important. So take a stool, sit down next to the operating table. It is always better to use gravity that will help uh, kind of fill up the veins for you. And of course, your temperament and comfort is equally important. Uh, there are many places who like to use uh, Prilox, which is a combination of lignocaine and prilocaine, so that the child does not feel, uh, the child or the adult, whoever you are using it on, uh, does not feel pain. But remember that prilocaine can cause vasoconstriction. So a good looking vein can sometimes especially if the other factors are not taken into consideration, like the hydration of the child, the vein can vasoconstrict and collapse. So you may use it, but just remember this fact. Now, here's a small video for you to demonstrate how you insert a peripheral venous axis in a small baby. Look at the way I'm holding the arm. There's nobody else holding the hand and making the vein prominent for me. I am holding the hand between my uh, non-dominant hand, index finger and the middle finger. And I'm stretching the skin as I bend the knuckles uh, of this child uh, downwards. Okay. And then I give it a gentle squeeze so that the vein starts becoming prominent. This is a 24 gauge cannula. I give a small nick so that it is easier for the catheter to get inserted. The backflow can sometimes be very slow. So remember to stop inserting once you get a backflow, tilt it down a little bit and then push it forward. Remember to remove all air bubbles as you flush the venous cannula. Yes, it is often useful to use some form of aid whenever the vascular axis is difficult. So there have been a couple of infrared devices in the market that can be used for this purpose. But this systematic review and meta-analysis has shown that overall the infrared devices are not very useful. Uh, they might be useful in some difficult intravenous cannulations. Another technique is the transillumination technique. And you could use a vein torch or you could even use the light of your mobile phone. It is particularly helpful in neonates, younger children, even elderly patients who have thin skins. But the only um, disadvantage is that you really have to switch off most of the lights in the operation theater so that there is darkness enough for the veins to be highlighted. But the most talked about and the most studied technique uh, is the ultrasound guided peripheral venous axis. Uh, I'm sure ultrasound has uh, become available and each passing year, more and more of you are going to have ultrasound around. The, uh, there was this recent meta-analysis that, that got published in 2018 in British Journal of Anesthesia, which compared the ultrasound guidance of peripheral venous axis with the routine palpation and direct visualization technique. And... The, this was done on more than 1,600 patients and the odds ratio was 2.49 in the favor of ultrasound guidance. And the conclusion read that the ultrasound guidance increases the success rate of peripheral intravascular cannulation, especially in patients with known or anticipated difficult IV access. Now, this is a, a video for you to see the ultrasound guided peripheral line insertion. Look at the way uh, I'm holding. So I have the hockey stick probe, which is high frequency linear ultrasound, which is very useful for very surface structures like the peripheral vein in this case, in my non-dominant hand. And in my dominant hand, I have the uh, venous cannula. And then as I watch 
as I identify and look at the vein, which is there on the screen, I try and guide my needle towards the vein there. And once I see the white dot inside the vein, I actually pull out my needle, confirm the backflow, and then I push it inside. Now, the disadvantage of using a routine peripheral venous cannula with this technique is that uh, particularly the 24 gauge is a very short cannula. And as you saw in the video, that there was hardly any distance left for it to be threaded inside the vein. Okay. Now, another question for you, and that is, can a peripheral venous axis be taken on a paralyzed arm? Yes or no? What do you think? Uh, Dr. Vibha, while they type the answers, you can take mm -hmm. a break for a second or so. Sure. I'll see the answers and let you know. Sure. So, uh, as ma'am has asked you, can a peripheral venous axis be taken on a paralyzed arm? So, we have Dr. Poonam, Dr. Poonam says no, Dr. Hina says yes, Dr. Prabhakar, another yes, Sumetha, yes. So we have divided poll, half of them say yes and half of them say no. So ma'am, please uh, tell us what to do. Yeah, so I think both the answers are correct. And uh, this is because that the traditional concept was that on a paralyzed arm, we should not take the peripheral venous axis. And the thought process behind this was the fact that the, uh, the uh, it, it, uh, if you have put any kind of venous axis on a paralyzed arm, there is a higher risk of deep vein thrombosis. That is because the musculature of the hand act as pumps to keep the blood flowing and the blood uh, becomes stagnant or static in a hand that is um, paralyzed. And that is the reason why it has been considered that it should not be used. Also, the fact that pain may not be felt and that could cause delay in diagnosing extravasation. But the current evidence mentions that it can be placed. But one, it should be monitored closely. And second, that it should be placed only until you have a suitable axis secured. Okay, so it is still a relative contraindication. Now, my favorite peripheral venous axis in a child or an adult with difficult venous axis, <clears throat> particularly in the perioperative scenario, is the external jugular vein. And that is because of different reasons. One, that in most of the surgeries towards the head end where the anesthesiologist stands, you have a vein jutting there. It is rarely used earlier, even if the patient has a previous history of difficult venous axis, less likely that the external jugular vein would have been used. And it is often quick to secure. But the trick here is, that you need to bend the needle about 10 to 15 degrees so that you get adequate place <clears throat> so that you get adequate place and your cannula does not hit the angle of the mandible so this is how you would do an external jugular vein cannulation your non dominant hand you're going to put a single finger towards the distal end of the external jugular vein so that it allows the vein to fill up a little bit. You can hold the cannula between your thumb and the index or the middle finger. And the remaining two fingers of your dominant hand will actually uh, be used to stretch the skin underneath so that you get a taut skin and puncturing the vein is easy. That's all for now about peripheral venous axis. If there's anything that you want to know and you want me to cover, uh, I would like be happy to answer that in the Q&A uh, duration. Now I move on to the midline axis. Now, knowing the deep arm veins anatomy is very important whenever you're planning for a midline catheter or a peripherally inserted central catheter, which is called as the pick line. And as you can see in this diagram, 
A brachial artery is often accompanied by one or more brachial veins and there is a separate basilic vein towards the median side of the arm and a cephalic vein that runs on the lateral side of the arm. So these are the deep arm veins and whenever we are securing a pick line or a midline uh, catheter, it is one of these veins that we puncture. Then what is the difference between the two? Well, the difference is that the midline catheter is a peripheral venous axis and the pick line is long catheter where the tip of the catheter is at a central venous location and that is the SVCRA junction. So that is the difference. The length of the catheter is the difference in these two axes. So midline catheter typically is 10 to 20 centimeters in length. It is inserted using ultrasound guidance and it is short duration access. It is typically used for giving say antibiotics for two to three weeks. It should not be used for high osmolar solutions. Now, I have a video for you demonstrating how to access the midline. So as I said, this is the deep arm vein. You can see me holding the linear transducer in the non-dominant hand. And with the right hand, I have a needle prepped up to perform an ultrasound guided puncture. So here you can see there's a big basilic vein sitting. I have confirmed that it is a vein by compressing it. And now you can see the needle has entered the vein. Once the needle has entered the vein, it can be identified by looking at the back flow. And then you would thread in the guide wire. I always like to confirm that the guide wire is present in the vein. And that is what is done. You can see the guide wire that has come down into the vein. It is very close to that wall. And then since there is no dilator available with midline catheters, you would have to give a nick with the needle or something similar and then thread in the catheter as you remove the guide wire. You have to check the backflow and then fix. On the right hand side, you can see how we have fixed the midline catheter. We use stat locks uh, to fix them and we label them as midline because in my hospital we have many pick lines which look very similar from outside. So it is important that we label them as midline catheters so that no drug that is um, hyperosmolar or hyper or hypooncotic or irritant or vesicant is used through this line. Now I move on to the non-tunneled central venous axis, which is the typical central line that most of us would do. Okay, I would want to begin with this question. For a short duration central venous axis, which is your preferred vein for cannulation? So you want to do a central line, which is required just for short duration. What is the vein of your choice? Is it the internal jugular vein? Is it the supraclavicular subclavian vein? Is it the infraclavicular subclavian vein? Or is it the femoral vein? Um, we have internal jugular vein as one of the options. Dr. Asaf has said it's a femoral vein. Again, a femoral vein. Dr. Sushmita thinks it's an uh, internal jugular vein, option A. So we have a divided opinion again about A and D. Sure. Um, so I wouldn't answer it right here. I'm going to, sorry. But majority are towards A. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, so I'm not going to give out the answer here. And I'm going to discuss each of these veins and let us see what uh, you think about it. So typically, the internal jugular vein is what is uh, considered uh, as their first choice by many, mainly because we have been trained to insert uh, internal jugular veins. So probably my maximum central line punctures have been internal jugular vein, uh, followed by subclavian and femoral 
is not a very common central venous axis to perform mainly because of higher risk of infection and thrombosis associated with it. But there are specific indications for femoral vein also, and I'll come to it in a minute later. <clears throat> Between IJV and subclavian, IJV is uh, something that is more convenient during the surgery. You have the ports pointing towards you, whereas subclavian venous access is preferred if it, it, if it needs to stay for a little longer duration, say up to two to three weeks, because it is more comfortable for the patient. Between the sides, the right internal jugular vein is preferred because of its easier straighter path the less complications that are associated uh, with the right side over the left side. And it's also conducive for ultrasound guidance as against the subclavian vein, which is a little difficult to be performed under ultrasound guidance. Now, talking about femoral central line, those of you who have selected, um, I think this line is a very useful line if you're planning to take a central venous axis during an ongoing CPR because the neck, the uh, chest is relatively inaccessible for you. It is also stable in a trauma patient where there is unstable cervical spine, uh, though uh, you could still uh, do a subclavian in such situation. And of course, anything any surgery which is around your superior mediastinum or uh, for a dialysis sheath, if your right-sided IJV is not available, then the left IJV or the subclavians run at more acute angles for a stiff dialysis sheath. And that is the reason why a femoral venous axis uh, is preferred. And of course, for patients with superior vena cavill syndrome. Now, I'm going to start with internal jugular vein, and um, there are different approaches that have been described with landmark technique based on the position of the sternocleomastoid, the sternal head, the clavicular head, and the scalene muscles into anterior approach, central approach, and posterior approach. And I'm not really going to go into the details of this. I'm going to ask you to read them up because there are some examiners who would want to hear the landmark guided approaches. But what is going to be there in the future for you is an ultrasound guided line. And in my hospital, all the uh, venous accesses, particularly the central venous accesses are done using ultrasound. So these are the recent guidelines. Um, published in European Journal of Anesthesiology 2020. Uh, these are the European Society of Anesthesiology guidelines on the perioperative use of ultrasound guided vascular axis, also called as Perseus vascular axis. And it defines the expanse, expanse of ultrasound use while placing a vascular axis. And it includes not just the pre-procedural vein screening, assessment, and identification of the vein you want to select, but also the use of ultrasound uh, using a real-time puncture. Like you saw in the previous videos, uh, ultrasound is used to actually look at the needle as the needle progresses into the tissue. It is also useful in verifying that the guide wire is in the vessel, as I showed in one of the videos previously, and also verification of the catheter. Verification of the catheter direction is very use, is very important aspect whenever you're doing a central venous scanlation, and I'm going to talk about it a minute later. Also, it is useful in verifying where the tip of the central line lies, and it helps in identifying complications like inadvertent arterial puncture or pneumothorax. So how would you assess the venous axis, say, if you want to perform an internal jugular vein cannulation? So this is the screening method that has been described, and it is called as the 
RACVA, which stands for Rapid Central Vein Assessment. So it is a systematic, standardized approach for ultrasound assessment before any central venous catheterization. And there are seven points that you need to slide the ultrasound probe so that you completely perform this assessment. So the first point starts from the midneck where the IJV and the relation to carotid artery is assessed in the IJV high approach. And then you slide it down further uh, in the lower third of the neck uh, where you mostly would see IJV and carotid uh, side by side. And then as you slide it further upon the sternoclavicular joint and you tilt it a little bit, you will be able to see where the internal jugular vein and the subclavian merges to form a brachiocephalic. Then you have to slide the probe a little lateral so that you are able to look at the supraclavicular view of the subclavian vein. And then you slide it further below the clavicle to have a look at the infraclavicular subclavian and then put it into a long axis to continue looking at the axillary vein and the in the deltopectoral groove where the cephalic vein joins the axillary vein. And then the last point is over the upper lobe of the lung to be able to assess a baseline assessment of pneumothorax. And this can be repeated after placing the um, central venous line. And what do you really look at while you slide this uh, ultrasound probe? You are looking at the path of the vein. You are looking at the size of the vein because based on the size is the decision of the uh, uh, how at what gauge catheter you will possibly be able to use. You are also looking at at what depth uh, from the skin lies the vein. You are going to look at the patency, the flow of blood into it proximity to other important structures and whether it is collapsing during inspiration. So uh, these are the different views that you would get to see in your RACIVA screening. This is the internal jugular vein and the carotid artery. As you slide down, they are side by side. The overlap is reduced and the subclavian vein is what you start looking at. This is the junction of the subclavian vein and the brachiocephalic vein. I, this view will come to you again when I'm demonstrating one video. And then this is the subclavian vein, the view four above the clavicle where you're looking at the subclavian vein in the long axis view. And then this is the infraclavicular uh, view of the subclavian and the axillary vein and the axillary artery. And this is the lung ultrasound. You look at the pleura, you run an M mode over it to identify the uh, sandy beach appearance, which means that there is pleural sliding and there is no pneumothorax. Now, uh, the most important um, identification of the vein lies in its differentiation from the artery. And there are a couple of tests that have been described and the most commonly performed is the vein compressibility. So whenever you press, uh, provide a gentle pressure, remember a gentle pressure, because if you're giving a firm pressure to a patient who's hypotensive or in a child, even the artery can collapse. So a gentle pressure would show you that the vein has collapsed and the artery does remain patent. You can throw in some color, uh, activating the Doppler button and you can see a pulsatile pattern in the artery, whereas a continuous flow in the vein. Something that I really find useful and more reliable whenever uh, there is difficulty in uh, identifying the difference, like typically a subclavian vein, if you are assessing, not usually does a subclavian vein collapse with the ultrasound probe. And what is useful in such situations is the pulsed wave Doppler. And I'm going to show you this video. So I'm actually applying pressure, but if you see that the artery and vein, none of them really collapse. Then I throw in some color, but both of them seem to be filling up. And now when you see the pulse wave Doppler, you can see there's a significant difference in the way you see the pulses in the vein and the artery. And that is 
uh, I think the most um, appropriate way to differentiate between an artery and a vein. Uh, two important aspects that you need to well verse yourself whenever you are using ultrasound for vascular access, and that is in plane technique or out of plane technique. So out of plane is when the ultrasound probe is perpendicular to the vein beneath so that you the view that you get on your screen is a cut section, cross section of the vessel uh, could be rounded or could be oval. Whereas in in plain technique, uh, what you would uh, you would place the transducer along the length of the vessel, and you would see the vessel across the screen from the left to the right. Now another important structure whenever you are performing an internal jugular vein cannulation is to identify the vertebral artery because it is often very close posterior to the internal jugular vein and can often be larger in children as compared to adults. So watch this video closely. You can see the carotid here. You can see the internal jugular vein. And when I move my Doppler, you can see that the vertebral artery is sitting just right behind the internal jugular vein. And that is the reason why you need to do a real time cannulation looking at the tip of your needle as it traverses through these structures so that you are able to avoid the counter puncturing of the vessel and inadvertent injury to other structures, vertebral artery in this case. Now, uh, I already mentioned the in-plane and out-of-plane technique, and it's also called as the out-of-plane is called as the short axis, and the in-plane is also called as the long axis. There are advantages and disadvantages of both. So the I think the advantage of short axis is that you are able to differentiate the carotid and the vertebral artery along with the internal jugular vein in the short axis. But if you are not trained, it is a little difficult to uh, keep uh, looking at the tip of the uh, needle as it is going in. Whereas the advantage of long axis is that you can actually look at the entire length of the needle, but here you miss on to looking at the surrounding structures. And probably a sweet mean between both the techniques is the oblique axis. And the oblique axis is performed at 45 degrees tilt between the uh, horizontal and the vertical positions wherein you can you would look at the vein and uh, what happens actually is that the vessel gets elongated and so that you are able to look at the length of the needle as you puncture and you also have the important structures in your background so this is a video that is going to demonstrate that and uh, here you go so you see that i have uh, put it initially as the short axis view. And then as I tilt it, both the vein, you can see that the probe has tilted, both the vein and the RT has elongated. And you can see the entire length of the needle, including the needle tip that has entered. And this is the way we looked at the guide wire going down towards brachiocephalic vein, making sure that it is going towards the heart. So this technique is actually a very useful technique. Following the catheter, uh, following the guide wire to assess where the tip direction has gone. And this is uh, what we had uh, published earlier. So in this image, if you see that the guide wire that is coming, whenever you try to visualize above the sternoclavicular joint, the subclavian vein and the brachiocephalic vein simultaneously, you can actually see the guide wire gone into the subclavian vein if it is a uh, misdirected guide wire. Whereas you may have to pull that guide wire out and then push it in so that you have to see the guide wire going through the brachiocephalic vein downwards. And this technique will help you avoid the inadvertent subclavian vein malposition. Now, yes, it has gone down towards the heart, but is it uh, close 
to the SVCRA junction. And another technique that has been described is the eco-guided identification of the tip direction. And what is essentially required in this technique is that you agitate saline after you've placed your catheter, you agitate it, and somebody simultaneously, you can see this hand here, does a transthoracic echo. And what we are going to look at are the passage of air bubbles through the right atrium into the right ventricle. And you can see this as I flip through this video. So you can see that the center line is placed. There is agitation of the saline. This is the trans. See here, here you can see these bubbles and now the bubbles have disappeared. Okay, so it is a very, very short duration image that you need to focus and capture that whenever the saline is pushed through the center line, you would be able to see the agitated bubbles passing from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Now, an essentially important question for all of you. What is the ideal central line tip position? A, cavo atrial junction. B, the middle third of SVC. C, upper third of SVC. Or D, right atrium. The audience can post their polls. So, ma'am, the answer is A, cavo atrial junction. Dr. Hina says that. Dr. Rachna says B, middle third uh, SVC. Again, an A, Dr. Kuna. Dr. Girja says A, so most of them are saying A. Sure. Um, well, cavo atrial junction is the right answer, though middle third SVC um, is can be acceptable. I mean, the ideal location is the cavo atrial junction. So let's see what happens. Why is it important that it needs to be at the cavoatrial junction? If your catheter tip lies above this level, the risk of thrombosis and catheter malfunction is higher. And if your tip lies below this level, then it increases the risk of developing arrhythmias. And how do you identify the cavoatrial junction? On the chest x-ray, it is about three centimeters inferior to the bifurcation of trachea, which is the carina. Okay. But as I said, probably the lower third SVC is also acceptable. And then what does it really translate into? What length of central line would you require? For an adult, based on the height of the patient, there are some formulas and that is height divided by 10 minus 1 if you're using the right internal jugular vein or for the subclavian, it is minus 2. On the left side, for internal jugular, it's plus 4 and plus 2 for left subclavian. Uh, though ballpoint numbers could be on the right side, 13 to 15 centimeter length and left side, 15 to 17 centimeters. In children, an easy way to assess that is to check the length from the entry point to the sternal angle. And this can be followed in adults as well. The most authentic way to identify the appropriateness of the central line tip location is the intracavitatory ECG. So the catheter that goes in needs to sense the ECG as it is advancing. And this can be reflected by uh, the intracavitatory ECG technique, which I'm going to show in the next slide. So as you can see that the, as the catheter is coming closer to the SA node, uh, the P wave uh, looks normal. As it approaches closer and closer, the P wave is going to become taller and taller. And once it is beyond the SA node, it will start having the initial negative P wave deflection. So let us see if you can appreciate this in this video. So before I start, part of the central line axis should already be done. And then you're going to use this ECG adapter. You need to have this connector, which connects to the ECG cable. The red lead, which is normally put on the right shoulder has to go here. And uh, you need to start observing the ECG. Okay, so now you look at the ECG and the P waves start becoming taller. 
See, this is another lead which is there for you for comparison. And then as you keep pushing it inside, now the catheter has gone in a little bit more, you start looking at the biphasic P waves, that is the negative initial deflection is noted, which means you are beyond the SA node and you need to pull out your catheter. Now, coming to the million dollar question. Is a chest x-ray essential after a central line? You will say, Dr. Vibha, you've told us so many different ways of identifying whether your central line is correctly in place, whether it's correctly directed. You've even told us where the tip is going to lie. Now, why do we need to have a chest x-ray? So uh, this multi-center study, which is under the Choosing Wisely campaign, try to assess if a routine chest X-ray is required after ultrasound guided central venous catheter insertion. And the study was a retrospective study of more than 6,000 patients. The incidence of pneumothorax and catheter malposition was very, very low. It was 0.33% and 1.31% respectively. The incidence was least when the catheter was from a right IJV location. So you can look at the glass as half full or half empty. You may think that the incidence is very low or you may think, but it still can occur. So I leave the choice up to you to decide. Uh, as I mentioned that the recent Pursuous Vascular Access Guidelines, what is written in these guidelines is that ultrasound is fast and fairly accurate technique to identify central venous axis related complications, including the malpositions. They do not have a clear say on whether chest x-ray should be done or should not be done. Now, I'm going to move on to the subclavian venous axis. Um, and as you know, it can be supraclavicular or an infraclavicular approach. Now, this is the demonstration of an uh, infraclavicular subclavian. First step is the identification of the subclavian artery and the vein, and then an ultrasound guided puncture of the subclavian vein. And then once the needle is inside the vein, you can see the shadow of the rib out there because of the because of which the subclavian vein uh, visualization can get hampered in some situations. I'm going to run a little briskly through this because I realize that we are close to 6 p.m. Uh, this is another technique, which is the supraclavicular subclavian axis. And uh, you can see that the probe is positioned over the clavicle and tilted towards the feet of the uh, patient. And you can see the inline needle approaching. And in this position, you're going to see the brachiocephalic and the subclavian vein, uh, as I had shown in the earlier videos. And you can actually start seeing the needle entering through the subclavian vein into the brachiocephalic vein. And this is how you need to put in a guide wire. And then the guide wire again has to be traced into the brachiocephalic vein. This is the way, is one of the ways that supraclavicular subclavian can be secured. It can be secured either posteriorly above the clavicle or inferiorly below the clavicle. And I prefer doing it inferiorly because it is more comfortable for the patient. The next question for you all, which vein cannulation has the least risk of unintentional arterial puncture? Is it the subclavian infraclavicular? Is it the cephalic vein in the arm? Is it the antecubital vein at the elbow or the femoral vein in the groin? Which of the vein has the least risk of unintentional arterial puncture? Ma'am, uh, the answer, Dr. Sadna gives a C. Dr. Hina says it's a B, another B. So Dr. Sumedha <laughs> says it's A. So I think a lot of people are confused. Well, yeah. Rahul says it's a B. Okay. So I think the uh, answer here lies in the fact that the veins that are accompanied with arteries definitely have a risk of unintentional arterial puncture. And amongst the veins that I've given, cephalic vein is a vein that is not accompanied by an artery. And so the correct answer here would be B, the cephalic vein in the arm. 
Um, Seldinger technique is something that is used for central venous catheterization. Modified Seldinger technique in which instead of needle, you use a ca angiocat or a ca um, catheter helps you identify the arterial puncture. So in a regular Seldinger technique, you would um, get a backflow, you would put in a guide wire, you would dilate, and you would know that it is an accidental arterial puncture only after you have dilated the vessel, but this can be avoided if you are following modified Seldinger technique. This is how a typical chest x-ray would look in an unintentional arterial cannulation. You can see the line, the, it's a subclavian axis or possibly a pick line which has come from the arm. And if this line crosses beyond or towards the left side of the spine, there is a high chance that your vessel is uh, arterial and it's lying in the aorta. Whenever you see something like this, and of course, you will have a uh, backflow, you will not be able to connect an IV fluid, uh, which will not pass with gravity. Uh, remember that be careful, do not just pull out this line because it can cause massive bleeding and arterial dissection. It needs to be done under surgical guidance. The only arterial line that you can really pull out safely is the femoral arterial puncture. But remember that you need to provide compression for 15 to 20 minutes. One of the um, one of the complications of, uh, say, cannulations, repeated cannulations or longer duration cannulations are the vein thrombuses. And these need to be identified as you screen the vessel. I just had a video and I thought uh, maybe it will be useful for you to identify how a vein thrombus looks. So as we screen the internal jugular vein, you start seeing a filling defect in there and that is the internal jugular vein. When you fill in color, initially there is good color and then the color disappears, showing that the thrombus is actually occupying significant portion of the internal jugular vein. Okay, the next question for you all is, which is a better line for volume resuscitation? So let us assume that you are doing uh, you are in a major surgery and suddenly there has been um, a significant amount of blood loss and you are planning to run in your peripheral, uh, run in your intravascular, sorry, run in some crystalloids. So you have a peripheral cannula, which is 20 gauge, and you also have a central line, which is seven French triple human uh, catheter. Which one do you think is better line to rush in your fluids. Ma'am, you can take a break while I'll just analyze the answers and tell you. So we have some A's coming up, one or two B's. Let's wait for the more answers. So it's a very interesting question. We have another A, a couple of A's more. Okay. So um, yes, the correct answer is A. You know, most would think that if I have a central line, you know, central line is probably the best way to give, but not so. And the answer lies in knowing the flow rates with different gauges and different length of catheters. And this depends on the hagen poiseuille equation. I'm going to ask you to go through it yourself. But if you look at this table, which actually shows each gauge, the length of each peripheral cannula and the maximum flow rate that can be achieved through them. Assuming that a triple lumen 7 French usually has two 18 gauge and one 16 gauge lumen and the length of your catheter is 20 centimeters, even if you were to connect the crystalloid through the 16 gauge lumen, you would get up to a maximum of 50 ml per minute, whereas your uh, 20 gauge peripheral cannula is going to give you 60 ml per minute. So the correct answer is a peripheral venous cannula and it is highly recommended to have wide bore peripheral cannula in place whenever you are anticipating blood loss. Coming to the end of the central line and uh, this question is regarding the central line removal. Which of the following is not, okay, is not a requirement during central line removal. A, patient should lie supine or Trendlenburg. B, ask the patient to hum 
like make this sound hmm hum or provide vowel salva during pulling out the catheter c provide occlusive dressing for 24 hours after central line removal and d is to place a stitch at the puncture point ma'am the answer some of them are saying is place a stitch at the puncture point there is a competition between b and d some of them are saying it's a ask the patient to hum or provide a vowel salva there's a c also i have seen it says provide occlusive dressing let's see okay a couple of so, b's and d's okay so the correct answer is d and that is because to avoid the risk of air embolism i'm sure very few of you have really pulled out the central line yourself mostly it's done by the nursing staff but it is important for you to know so that you are able to guide them correctly so patient has to either lie supine or in ideally a trendlenburg position patient should never be sitting position it is always good if they can provide they can hum which actually helps provide vowel salva while you're putting out pulling out the catheter so that the air does not get sucked in between the catheter and the skin entry point and also according to the guidelines it is important that you provide an occlusive dressing for the 20, for 24 hours after uh, the central line removal and what is really not necessary is to place a stitch at the puncture point moving on to the long term vascular axis and the first of its is the peripherally inserted central venous catheter i have already spoken about the deep arm vein anatomy i'm sure some of you have placed this catheter cavafix which is considered the older generation peripherally inserted central catheter whereas these are the newer generation what is the difference between the two the older generation pick lines are usually placed in superficial veins at elbow whereas the newer generations are placed in the deeper veins and hence they require ultrasound guidance these catheters are also through a tear away sheath so that the vein does not get dilated too much whereas the uh, cavafix or similar catheters are actually catheter in needle device and when you pull out the needle your vein has ended up being wider than the catheter in place and hence there are more chances of thrombosis as well as infection with these catheters similar to the rasiva screening that is required for the central venous axis there is rapiva screening that is the peripheral venous axis screening rapid assessment whenever you are planning to do a peripherally inserted central catheter and these are the locations along the elbow as you slide up through the medial arm and then go laterally to look at the cephalic vein and then move up as the cephalic vein enters your axillary vein and then towards the subclavian vein now where would you want to do the puncture point and for that uh, there are dorsal zones which have been described red zone which is close to the elbow the lower one third should be avoided the green zone that is the most uh, optimal zone is the middle one third of the arm and the yellow zone is close to the axilla and that it is uh, called yellow zone because if you do a puncture there remember to tunnel it out through the middle one third so for all practical purposes the uh, puncture point near the middle one third of the arm is what is preferred for these catheters here's a quick video for you demonstrating the pick line insertion so you can see me screening the vessels and then using a hockey stick probe ultrasound guidance uh, i have punctured the basilic vein uh which is seen with the backflow the guide wire is put in uh confirming the guide wire position i have trimmed this video so that uh, it runs a little faster this is a c arm identification tracing of the guide wire towards the heart because i am not using intracavitatory ecg here this is the dilator sheath that is available and then you put in the catheter and then you would tear away the sheath uh, and fix the catheter so this is how uh, the pick line is at the end of the procedure check for backflow flush it 
and this is how you would dress it up. On the right hand side, you can see for uh, pick lines, which are longer duration, we actually use the chlorhexidine impregnated dressing, transparent dressing. Um, remember that pick line tip can migrate with arm movement. And because you put the pick line when the arm is at right angle to the body, whenever the patient takes the arm by the side, the pick line that you have appropriately placed can actually move into the right atrium. And this uh, is seen in adults also, but very classically seen if you're doing it in children. So remember that the pick line can migrate. So put the hand by the side while you decide the final tip position. Moving on to the tunneled central venous axis. And uh, I'm going to demonstrate the Hickman catheter. As I said, that it has a cuff and this is the Dacron cuff which actually helps this catheter to stay longer in the body without developing infection because this catheter is going to stimulate the tissue around the puncture point so that uh, it gets sealed off. So uh, this is how, uh, this is the subclavian uh, puncture done for, uh, for the Hickman catheter. And this is the length of the catheter tunnel to an exit site, which is inferior and medial to the point of puncture. The size would depend on uh, whether it's a child and an adult and varying sizes from 4 French to 12 French are available. Here I have a quick video for you uh, for Hickman catheter placement. So an ultrasound guided IJV puncture is done. You can actually place the catheter both IJV or subclavian axis. Uh, you can see the tunneler rod. Actually, the catheter is very wide bore. It is 12 French catheter. So the tunneler is also really big. You can see that the catheter has been tied to the uh, catheter and then it is threaded in such a way that the cuff lies about four to five centimeters from the exit point. This is a child. So you can see uh, that the catheter length is identified uh, by uh, placing it over the sternal angle. And as you tear away the sheath, the catheter is being pushed inside. We also use CM screening for placing these lines because they help us identify if the catheter is kinked. And as you can see in this place, now that the catheter is correctly positioned, it is then finished up with a dressing. So this is the post Hickman catheter x-ray. The tip is lying somewhere here. This is how it has gone through the subclavian vein and the long tunneled pa part. And this is the exit site with the catheter outside the loop of the body. Sometimes these catheters, especially when we use it in younger children, are single lumen and they're also called as Brovia catheters. The next question for you all. The most suitable long-term vascular axis for patient who's requiring plasma pheresis is pick line, Hickman catheter, implanted port, or midline. So this is a patient who's going to keep requiring frequent plasma pheresis. Which do you think would be useful for this presentation, uh, for this uh, patient? Ma'am, we have... A uh, Hickman catheter as an option by several of our participants. Some of them say implanted port. Okay, okay so we so have the, uh, pick line yeah. also as an option. Yeah. So the answer here is Hickman catheter, and because of uh, because amongst all these lines, that is the only catheter which is wide bore. So as you know, plasma pheresis requires uh, the machine to pull out blood and then the it runs through the pheresis machine and uh, the blood is exchanged back into the body. And hence, Hickman catheter or a dialysis catheter is the most suitable for such indication, whereas the pick line, implanted port, and the midline are small lumen catheters. Just a touch on the implanted port. So what is an implanted port? So basically it is a silicon diaphragm and a port body uh, with the catheter that actually lies in one of uh, the greater uh, veins. It could be a subclavian or an internal jugular vein and the port is tucked 
uh, inside a subcutaneous uh, port pocket. You need to use special needles, which are the Huber point needles to access this because otherwise the silicon septum can get spoiled. I'm going to flip through the implanted port technique because uh, we are falling short on time. But what I really want you all to know is how to access. If you have a patient coming up for surgery who has an implanted port, you should know how to access that port. And this is the port access video. You can see the flange of the Huber needle is rotated upwards. The port will never be visible so much, but I've selected this patient for filming this video so that you are able to appreciate how the need the port is held with three fingers and how the needle is placed in. The first and the most important thing to perform is to check for backflow because if there is no backflow, it would mean that you have not correctly placed the needle. And remember that flushing these access devices is with push stop, push stop or a turbulent flow technique. So this is the way you're going to access the uh, port. And it is dressed up uh, like the image that was shown. And probably my final question to you all, you are called in to resuscitate a 10 year old in an emergency room with a feeble central pulse and an ongoing CPR. The child has poor venous access. Which axis would you prefer? Would you want to just do a repeat try at the peripheral venous axis? Would you want to do an external jugular vein puncture because um, it would still possibly be patent? Would you want to do a quick central line, maybe internal jugular, or subclavian, whatever you're familiar, familiar with, or you would want to do something other than the above? Ma'am, the answer coming up is external jugular vein. Uh, will one or two people say that it would be something other than the above? We again have an external jugular way. Yeah. Ayo, That's right. Ayo, absolutely right. So what you would really want to do in such a situation is to secure an intraosseous axis. And that is the last part of my talk, which I'm going to run you through. The reason I've included this is because it is one life-saving vascular access technique that each one of us listening to this talk today should know how to be, uh, perform and should be able to perform it confidently. It could be just once in many years that you could come across this situation, but it should be so well rehearsed in your mind about what you're going to do, how you're going to do that in that situation, you should be able to do it quickly and efficiently. Um, these are some of the locations uh, that are advisable, the tibia proximal, distal tibia, distal femur, or humerus proximal can also be used for adult patients. Now, this actually study I put up because this would answer the dilemma in answering the previous question. So this study actually looked at, they compared intraosseous axis and they compared central venous uh, access in adults undergoing resuscitation in the emergency department in patients who had a difficult peripheral access. And it showed that intraosseous uh, cannulation was quicker to perform and uh, the success rate was higher uh, with the first pass. And that's the reason why uh, many of the resuscitation councils, including European Resuscitation Council, gives a clear cut um, verdict on intraosseous axis. And they say if the peripheral venous axis is not secured after three attempts or two minutes of ongoing resuscitation, it is time for you to put the intraosseous axis. And how do you do it? Intraosseous axis needles are available, but uh, Easy IO is actually available in India. It is a motorized intraosseous needle, but what uh, we put it in our crash carts across the hospital are the sternal puncture needles because they are freely available, they can be re-sterilized and are equally effective. The intraosseous insertion technique 
is you hold the interosseous needle in your dominant hand with your non-dominant hand you actually stabilize the limb and then with a twisting motion you push the needle inside till there is loss of resistance remember to direct the needle a little away from the growth plate particularly if you're doing it in children uh, because that can have long-term consequences and the needle correctly placed stands on its own and you may or may not be able to aspirate bone marrow uh, but uh, if you're able to push in intravenous fluid without causing swelling in the local subcutaneous tissue most likely you are in place oh sorry there is one more question and i think this is the last question which of the following is not a contraindication. Remember, I'm asking for contraindications to interosseous needle placement and which of the following is not a contraindication. So is it osteogenesis imperfecta? Is it fracture in the desired bone? Is it previous attempt at securing interosseous axis in the same bone? Or is the child less than one year old? Ma'am, the answer most of them are giving is C, a previous attempt at interosseous access in the same bone. Okay. Well, well, we I... have somebody who says in a child less than one year old, but yes, majority of the answer is C. Yeah. So, well, actually, um, younger child and infant is not a contraindication for interosseous needle placement. If a previous attempt at interosseous access has been made in the same bone, which was unsuccessful for some reason, there is a possibility that there is already a hole in the bone. And if you are trying to make another hole when you're pushing, see, remember, the whenever you have an interosseous access in place, the IV fluid does not really flow by itself. You may have to exert some pressure uh, as you push the resuscitation drugs and even volume into the patient and there's a possibility that it can leak out through the hole that has already been made and hence the most appropriate answer is child less than one year old which is not a contraindication the remaining three are contraindications yep that's about it from my side i think i hope that with this topic i have inspired you all to develop more interest in the various vascular axis, um, the different types of vascular axis, and possibly to take a lead to form vascular axis services to be able to provide all the different type of accesses under one roof by one team, uh, which could be the vascular axis team. You as anesthesiologist could take a lead role in forming this vascular access team because you have the skills for placement. You are the best person to coordinate and train the remaining members of the team who could be nurses, including the infection control nurse or even the technicians. And this is my vascular access team. So all that I've shown so far is together with all of them. For those of you who are uh, interested on this topic, these are some of my publications and you could go through it, particularly for the long-term vascular access details. And a big thank you from my department. Thank you so much for patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Paral. And thank you, Naveen Malhotra, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Vibha. It was an excellent presentation. And if you Thank go through you. the chat box, it is full of praises for you. And I've been getting uh, direct uh, WhatsApp messages congratulating you for an excellent presentation. And I know Thank all you. the well, postgraduates must have been benefit for, from today's presentation. But ma'am, we have a few queries for you. May I take off the questions? Would you like to answer them? Sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. Ma'am, the first question we have is that the person congratulates you as we start with the question. And the question is, what is the make of the midline catheter you use? And when is the midline catheter preferred over a PIC line? 
Okay, so midline catheter is a peripheral venous axis and pick line is a central venous axis. So let me give you an example that if you have to give, say, antibiotic for somebody with a urinary tract infection and you want to give it for two weeks or three weeks, rather than changing two or three cannulas, you can go ahead and put one midline catheter and that would suffice. Now, why not pick? Yes, you can put a pick also, but picks are more expensive than midline catheters and they are sent central venous catheters. So if there is a possibility of infection, then uh, that turning into bacteremia is higher with a pick line. What is available uh, for us are the Vigon. Vigon is the name of the company, V-Y-G-O-N, Vigon, uh, midline catheters. They also have uh, ladder cats which are uh, 12 centimeters, 15 centimeter catheters, and they can be used as midlines. Okay, ma'am, the second question for you is, we don't use a uh, hyper or smaller drug in the midline catheters. Can we use it in the pick line? Yes, yes. Any central line, any catheter with a tip in the um, SVC RA junction or lower one third of um, the SVC, you can use all the drugs that I've shown for the central venous axis. Ma'am, the third question which is coming up for you is that can we put a peripheral venous axis in post-carcinoma breast surgery in the same hand? Same a hand. very interesting question because uh, the anecdotal knowledge says that it should not be done. And the reason for this was that uh, in a hand where the axillary nodes have been removed, there is a possibility of the patient developing lymphedema. lymphedema. But now the type of surgeries have changed. For I would say more than two thirds of my patients would undergo a breast conserving surgery with just a sentinel node biopsy rather than the complete axillary dissection. So lesser and lesser number of patients nowadays have a risk of developing lymphedema. And how would you really know that? So uh, studies have shown that if somebody is to develop lymphedema, that would happen in the first three years more than 95% of the patients who develop lymphedema in the first three years. And if they do not, which means their lymphatics are patent enough to handle. And in such patients, you can put a peripheral venous axis on that side. For the rest, I think it is better not to. Okay, ma'am. So uh, I hope we can make our uh, oncosurgeons understand this question also. Sure. And uh, the next question is, can we do ultrasound guided subclave in vein cannulation easily? Yeah, I mean, see, there is the difficulty that you have a very little space to work on. The moment you start taking the ultrasound closer to the clavicle, the vein starts slipping beneath. So even in the video I showed, though you could see my needle coming in, the actual puncture occurred under the clavicle and which could be risky. Uh, it can be avoided by moving, either doing an in-plane approach or moving more lateral towards the shoulder. But the more lateral it goes, I feel it's very uncomfortable for the patient because with the movement of the hand, your insertion site is going to move and that could cause movement of the catheter, which again is not good. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, what approach for peripheral venous axis uh, do you recommend if the patient has undergone multiple chemotherapies? Uh, which peripheral venous axis? So yes, most of your... our patients, we advise long-term vascular axis for them. So they would either select an implanted port or they would select a pick line. Now, there are definite indications for these and I really did not want the PGs to go into these details. But if somebody requires a chemotherapy every three weeks uh, for just one or one to three days, then an implanted port is better for them. But if somebody requires a chemotherapy session that is for hematological malignancies, where at a stretch, they would be admitted in a hospital for at least a week or 10 days, then the pick line is better because this needle is supposed to be kept inside for a shorter duration for implanted port. I'm not sure whether I've confused or um, <laughs> I have given the right answer. So ma'am, the last question is, up to what age the IO axis can be effectively placed? Uh, there are reports of IO axis being put in a neonate where 
the uh, access was difficult, but I wouldn't really advocate that. I think I would be more comfortable in uh, infants above three months of age, but that's just my personal opinion, I feel. There have been remote, uh, reports in neonates also. Okay. Ma'am, the last question is, how do we deal with a guide wire which goes repeatedly into the SCV while doing the access from IJV? So do you have any tips to avoid this kind of a problem? Yeah, so a couple of uh, maneuvers that can be done. So if you're putting through the IJV and it is going into the subclavian, right? So this angle needs to be made more acute, which is done by lifting the shoulder so that now it would want to go more down and not towards the subclavian. Also, the rotation of the head. If you rotate the head this side, there's a more likelihood that the vein would move towards the center rather than wanting to take an acute turn. But having said this, the most effective way I have found is to direct it is using an ultrasound approach. You actually see it, how it has gone. You trace the subclavian vein. You pull out the guide wire till it is slipped out of the subclavian, rotate it. And the J, if you rotate it inferiorly and push it, then it would most likely go into brachiocephalic. When the J lies on the side, either the left or the right side, it does end up going on one of the subclavian veins. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am. May I now invite Dr. Naveen Malhotra, sir? Dr. Sheer pleasure listening to you, Madam, uh, over the last Thank you, sir. one and a half hours or so, and so was uh, to all the uh, our viewers on uh, Zoom as well as on the YouTube channel. And for the benefit of all, uh, this recording is available on our uh, ISA website under the tab ISA Academics, and also on our ISA YouTube channel ISA NHK. Uh, without being biased, Madam, I listen. With glued eyes for the last 90 minutes or so. <laughs> it is the best compliment that I've got. Thank you so much, sir. Interesting topic made uh, more interesting by your videos and all the compliments which are coming are from uh, their sincere feelings of all the viewers. I, I just wanted to say that when I told this topic to sir, I'm sure he remembers. He was like, really? Vascular acts? Kuch aur bolo, Vibha. <laughs> I said, no, sir, if I do it, I'm sure you'll like it. So You have justified uh, your topic and I wish to have you uh, more often uh, on sure. ISA online PG classes with some, yes. uh, some of more interesting topics which you are doing day in and day out. Sure. But thank you very much again for sharing your uh, experience and teachings with all the members. And see you all next week, uh, same time, Monday, for a class on tracheostomy by Professor Devasis Paul from AMC Pune. Thank you very much. Thank you so sure. much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vibha. And I thank my audience. Uh, the recording is available on the YouTube as some of you have asked us. You can please go through it again and uh, you can be benefited by what Dr. Vibha has told you. Thank you so much.